My name is Toby Maloney. Um, I am the cons drink consultant for the beverage program here at the Rusty Knot. I'm also a uh, managing partner and head mixologist of the Violet Hour in Chicago. The Violet Hour is uh, more of a, an old school classic cocktail bar where this is a high-end dive tiki bar. Here it's five deep at the bar and so it's a whole different style of bartending. Um, you know, there it's all about jiggers and recipes and here it's a little more free form. The Violet Hour it comes from the speakeasy movement of the 20s and also um, my pedigree includes milk and honey and pegu and flat iron so took a lot of those ideas and reworked them for the Violet Hour. Uh, milk and Honey was open uh, in 2000 and it was kind of the first throwback bar here in New York. Well, there was Angel Share, but Milk and Honey really kind of paved the way um, for classic cocktails done classically, where it was all about technique and about, um, about taking old recipes and trying to recreate them as closely as possible to what they used to be. And once again, it was all about the ice and about the stirring technique and about the shaking technique, and um, which was a big departure. And also the use of jiggers. It was the first time I saw it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm positive that Dale DeGroff and Audrey Saunders were probably doing that earlier at Blackbird and uh, the Rainbow Room. But you know, Sasha really took it to the umpteenth degree. I mean, he dresses like it's 1920. He's got the 20s haircut, always wears a hat. You know, there's the rules, the rules at Milk and Honey. One of them, was it three, was gentlemen will not introduce themselves to ladies. If you would like an introduction, please ask the bartender. And uh, ladies, if a gentleman approaches you that you do not know, please lift, lift your chin slightly and ignore him. And that was definitely a throwback as well. It's all about the cocktail, it's about quiet conversation, it's you're in your seat, you talk to the person you're with, and so it's a great place for you know an old friend or your parents or somebody you just wanna sit and, and quietly converse and not get jostled and you know never have to raise your voice above the music. You know, it was like going to a, a really nice restaurant, but it was a bar, and I think that was, you know, it was really raising the bar, pardon the pun, raising the bar for the bars and where you know, conversation was king and sophistication instead of let's go out and get hammered. R restaurants became in the 80s and 90s like the new theater and the, the new entertainment where people would go out and eat as entertainment instead of just having it a meal. Where now bars, I think, are also taking that. People go out for drinks as entertainment instead of just getting drunk. The cooks are the first person, the cooks and chefs, like they'll have a sip and they totally get it. So, and then it trickles down. I, I, I like to describe the cocktail as, you know, when you're, when you're having a meal and you finally get all of the perfect amount on your fork and you have the bite, you know, and it works together and it's all balanced and, ev and everything's perfect, that's what a cocktail should be. Every sip should be that well balanced and nuanced and with different layers. I've gotten inspiration from, uh, from all over. Um, one of the drinks that I had I called the Starry Nights because I was, I was putting drops of bitters on top of an egg white drink and I started swirling it with a straw and it looked like the sky in Van Gogh and so and I think that a lot of bartenders get their inspiration from all over. Art Memories is another place like you know I was one of the drinks on my new menu in at the Violet Hour I wanted to recreate what it was like to go camping and so um, we had, I found this stone pine liqueur, which tastes like pine, and so I kind of switched it up and I made a Manhattan where you can taste the pine and smell the smoke. I put a smoky scotch in there, and so it was like being outside camping. Another thing I was trying to recreate was my mom's strawberry rhubarb pie, but I was doing it in a gin sour and I made a strawberry rhubarb syrup to, to, to hearken back to that time of of eating a piece of pie in the summer when you were young and and everything seemed great. One of the Manhattans I did before that, I wanted to, I was having a pulled pork sandwich and it was just so good, I totally wanted to make a drink that would taste like a pulled pork sandwich, so um, what did I, I did a little, a little, once again, a little smoke in it and I, I made my own peach bitters because there's that, that sweet, to it and then rye and 
there's, um, there's a vermouth called Carpano Antica that I find very meaty. And so I went with that. And it did taste, it was called the Blue Ridge Manhattan, and it tasted reminiscent of a pulled pork sandwich. Deconstructing and then making things, like I didn't want to, I could have put a piece of bacon or you know dehydrated some ham and put it in there, which that would be a little more West Coast, where I try to do things that are reminiscent of things or that uh, bring up memories. Because I think that both food and drink have such strong visceral, you have such strong visceral reactions to both food and drink. No, it's the, the more esoteric the things that you can find, the better for at least uh, most of the bartenders I know that like a pine liqueur. It's interesting and, and, and inspirational to try to find things to use that with. Um, we finally got a slow gin. Plymouth came out with a slow gin, which we've been needing for years. Laird's Applejack is also huge. Even going back to some of the things that every bar has, but doing it with, with a little more integrity, like you know, a, a good orange liqueur that um, is made with quality ingredients instead of flavors from New Jersey would be great. One of the new things that has just exploded is the Saint Germain, the elderflower liqueur, because it's made with such integrity and it's such a beautiful product. I think every, every bar that I know of has it. Yeah, it's, it was so cool and so bizarre that, you know, I had to figure out a way to, to utilize it in, in an interesting way. Once again, it would be going out and trying and finding something that maybe we haven't even thought of yet, that like the elderflower or something like that, that harkens to something very specific. So it's those more, those things, um, that have that have a place, like in memories, or or put you in a place. Like um, I was, I'm doing a hibiscus, old fashioned at the Violet Hour because I wanted to do Hawaii. For some reason, Hawaii was in my head, and so I made a hibiscus syrup and put it into an old fashioned, which doesn't really scream Hawaii, maybe, but it, it's an interesting dichotomy there. The products, products that bartenders like are complex and dry. Those are the two things that I think we look for the most because things that are sweet, I, we, we, wanna, we want to sweeten them ourselves, either using something as simple as simple syrup or you know some other modifier to, to add another com layer of complexity to it. So things like the rye, I prefer to work with rye than bourbon because bourbon already is so sweet. You know, I use a lot of bitters. And I think that's one of the big trends that's happening right now with all the bartenders that I know is either regular bitters, making your own bitters, or the potable bitters like, you know, Campari, Aperol, Chinar, uh, any of the Amaros. I think I'm seeing a, a trend where a lot of people are using those uh, products a lot more than, than we used to. Ice, I think that's a big, that's one of the big things because without, without good ice, you can't really make good drinks. If you have, if you, like this, this is good ice. This is uh, from a machine called Cold Draft. It's big, it's cold, it's uh, sturdy, it's dense, it's pure. Um, so that's, that's something that I think bartenders are looking at a lot more since, you know, here in the, there's also a big, I wouldn't say a rift, but there's a definite a West Coast style and an East Coast style of bartending, and you can, without a doubt, look at a recipe and tell which coast they're from. The East Coast is more, like I was saying, it's more traditional, and you know, and I'm painting in broad strokes here, without a doubt. But um, you know, here on the East Coast, we, we it's a lot more about technique and about the ice, um, and I think our sensibility here is trying to figure out the least amount of ingredients to put in a shaker. Um, where on the West Coast, if you think of even just like food, you know, here in the here in the East, it's a little more traditional, a little more French driven. And then on the West Coast, they're a little more free form and they use more exotic ingredients and it's a very different sensibility. Food ingredients bleed into their cocktails where they use lemongrass and basil and cilantro and things that I would prefer in my pasta sauce or pico de gallo instead of a cocktail. 
we really took a lot of the New York attitude and sensibility of these of these bars, and we moved it to Chicago, and there were many naysayers. And you know, we had we have five and a half ounce coupes with a little sidecar, and um, you know, Chicago being the home of the 16 ounce martini and the Flintstone steak, everybody, we were actually laughed at a couple of times. So like Chicagoans will never like that, and we stuck to our convictions, and it's been, I would say. Seven out of ten people get it in Chicago, which is about the same here in New York. This is something that not many people are doing. Uh, bartenders across the country so dislike the blenders. And um, I think it's, there's going to be a re resurgence with, with blenders because you can really get such a great texture. This is fresh squeezed lemon, lime orange juice, bitters, and simple syrup. Because this bar is so much faster than the Violet Hour, instead of picking up a bunch of things, I combined it all in here. So, gin and sour, makes a gimlet. Rum and sour, daiquiri. Balancing everything for the bartenders and so they don't have to think as much. And then this is a spiced rum. And so this is, the drink is, is a spice colada. And then, I'm gonna add just a dash of bitters. Nine ice cubes. I'm rather OCD. Everything has to be a prime number in my drinks. So you're doing two things with that. You're getting, you're whipping a lot of air into it, so it makes it light and lovely. And also, you're just you're grinding that the ice into just absolute Jamaican beautiful sand. The dash of bitters on top. This Angostura bitters has a lot of clove and cinnamon and kind of warm Christmas spices, but on something that is tropical as a colada, it makes it an interesting dichotomy. And then the parasol to keep, make sure it doesn't get sunburned. And there you go. Okay, so we're gonna make you a starry night, which is just a takeoff of a classic Gin silver sour. So, egg white, lemon juice, simple syrup, beef eater. Ooh, bartending before noon. We're gonna put a, just a dash of bitters in there. Um, then we're gonna do a dry shake or what we call a mime shake. This helps to get some air into the egg white. Then Five cold draft cubes, not four, not six, five. And then a real shake. You can see that the meringue coming out there. That could be a starry night. To go back and, and, and look at these old things and really do a lot of research and, and get into the history, you know, read people like Charles H. Baker and Dave Embry and Jerry Thomas was, a, you know, it was trying to, it was bringing history alive and being able to drink it, which was just amazing.